Hello, and welcome to UA Overtime. I'm your host, Jermaine Dennis, and I'm here with my fellow co-panelists, Victor Weberman, Ashley Whitfield, and um, Joe Marshall. But today, we're going to go into our first topic of the day, first quarter. We're going to talk about the MLB playoffs. After the Texas Rangers have uh, made a late-game rally comeback, it's now tied 1-1. Victor, what are your thoughts on who is going to win the World Series this year? Well, I still got the Cardinals. I'm sticking with them. They've been in this position before. They got tied by the Brewers 2-2. They ended up stealing a game on the road. I know they're going to Texas, Texas momentum, but I feel Cardinals can go in and steal a game, maybe two. They were, they've been down 2-1 to the Phillies. And the other thing is, in all the Cardinals World Series appearance, they've never been up one nothing, and they've come out with 10 titles. So to me, um, this, this is also a resilient bunch that came back from a 10.5 game wild card deficit in a matter of a month. So I, I still think you know, they're going to pull it out. All right, and uh, Joe, what do you think? Well, honestly, the first thing I want to say about the World Series is that without the Yankees, Red Sox, Phillies, I don't know if it was just me, but a lot of me and my friends were worried that, you know, who's going to care about the World Series right. without a big market team? And me personally being a Yankee fan, when they got knocked out, I got to go for an AL team. And I'm going to stick with the Rangers. They have the most powerful lineup. For, for a team that Josh Hamilton, as an MVP candidate and one of their best players, he has not produced at all. And I feel right. like it's only a matter of time before he comes out and that team is going to put up 12, 15 runs in one game. The Cardinals don't have a dominant starter, as in like a Verlander or a Sabathia, and I just feel like th there's nothing really that the Cardinals can do that the Rangers can't match. Right. I think I feel like uh, both teams have just just barely above average uh, pitching as far as the starting rotation is concerned. But um, like you said, I feel like the te Texas Rangers with their lineup, their batting lineup, that they should be able to pull it out sooner or later. Uh, start swinging the bats, even though Justin uh, Hamilton is going through a little injury uh, issues right now. Um, I think as far as the rest of the team, they're going to rally the troops and they're going to um, improve as far as hitting. Ashley, your thoughts? Um, I got Texas to win this series because, honestly, I just feel like they have a better, better overall lineup. You know, their pitching is a little bit better, and I just feel like the Cardinals just don't have what it takes to win a seven-game series against Texas. So, Right, uh, and you know what's so funny about that is that um, – when I was watching the game last night, you saw the heart of the champion in, in the far, as far as the Texas Rangers is concerned. Um, Ian Kinsler, when he hit that, you know, got the base hit, and then he stole to second base. Yeah. And, and, and then that whole way how that all unfolded, you could kind of see that with their backs against the wall, they showed the heart of the champion, where um, the next couple of games is going to be, well, three games is going to be in uh, Texas. Yeah, so I really right. see the advantage now is in Texas' hands. And um, I think that the Cardinals really should be looking as uh, they really need to pressure to get at least one game out of these next three games. Absolutely. Another thing to focus on is that Ron Washington was someone that last year, two years ago, he was going to be gone after what happened with his entire episode with the drugs. Right. And Nolan Ryan and the whole Rangers organization had faith in him. And now they kept him. Look where they are. They're you know, right. three games away from having a World Series championship. Unreal. Right. Good call. Yeah, definitely is. Definitely is. Yeah. Um, now we'll be going to our first commercial break. When we come back, we'll go and talk about the second quarter, which is, all, which is about the LSU suspensions. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now we're going to go into our second quarter debate of the day. We'll be talking about the NCAA football LSU Tigers. Now you know this past weekend, BCS standards came out and LSU was number one. But their next game, they have to face three suspensions from three players on their team because of the use of synthetic marijuana. Ashley, does this open the door for the LSU Tigers to actually get upset by the Auburn Tigers this weekend? You know what, Jermaine? I definitely think it does. I think that Auburn has a much better chance now. You know, LSU, they lost a starting running back, and they lost, you know, one of their best defensive players. So I really feel like they have a better chance. That is if they play well this weekend. All right. And Joe? The way I look at it is, even though they're, they're losing a big player in Tyron Matthew, He's their, their, star D, their star D back. He's their, the Ed Reed of that team. He right. makes all the plays, and their leading rusher. 
but they're number one for a reason. It's not because of one or two or three players. They overall have a better team. Not to mention that I know Auburn is a national championship, the defending national champion, but they're sending in a new quarterback. This is going to be his first start. Clint Mosley has never started before. Now his first game as a collegiate quarterback, 19-year-old kid going in, is, to death, is at Death Valley. LSU has one of the most intimidating home stadiums to play at. I still don't think it gives Auburn a chance. More of a chance, yes, but overall LSU is going to take them down. Right. I, I, I also agree because of the fact that um, their offense has been struggling Auburn. Um, they're 106 in passing, and um, they're 76 in um, rushing yards. So the, you know there's a, there's a struggle with their offense. So uh, although they're, they're um, Tyron, wait, Tyran Matthew, their Heisman watch on the LSU team is out, that the uh, LSU Tigers have a, a defense that's just suffocating, that they, they just take over. They're seventh in the league, I mean in the nation, as far as yards against them in, in per game. So... I, I definitely believe that Auburn Tigers is not going to be able to out, out, like, outduel the LSU Tigers. But. Yeah, the defense definitely takes a hit, especially the secondary. Not only do they, do they lose Teron Matthew, one of the best corners you know, in the country, but they also lose Tharold Simon, who's also a starter. And then they lose Spencer Ware, who's the leading rusher. Um, and you know what? LSU's gone through this four. They had their starting quarterback, Jared Jefferson, um, Jordan Jefferson, excuse me. He, was, he had faced suspension. Jared Lee came in, did a great job. They're now 7-0. and they have, a two system, they have a two quarterback system that's working right now. And let's be honest, Les Miles is a winning coach. They win. They haven't lost a game at home since, you know, the Tebow era when Florida came in. So right. this, this is a great team, and they're, they're not, they're not going to roll over and let and this win. Especially like. that the fact that they're at home yeah. is the fact that you're not going to come in Death Valley, and um, even though they're missing three, three great players, players on the team, Auburn is just not strong enough yeah. to come in and uh, take a victory. Um, but, you know, alongside with that, there's been a couple of other issues in NCAA. We have William Goldstein with the incident, with the punching incident. Just last night, Arizona and uh, UCLA gets into a brawl um, during the game. What can the NCAA do to uh, kind of fix this uh, situation with the uh, collegiate athletes and their misconduct? Uh, Joe, what are your thoughts? Honestly. The problem is that there's nothing that they can make a rule to say they have to behave themselves. The punishments the NCAA laid down, they're strong and they're strict. It's just that there's happen every single day. The kids get suspended for each different school, and it's just I don't understand what they're thinking. You are, have a Division One scholarship. They are paying you to go to school to yeah. play football there. You have one responsibility to play football. What Tyran Matthew is doing, messing around with drugs, right. you are given everything. You are a god down there. And LSU, you'll walk around campus in LSU, and the fact that they're going to go around and behave like, like little kids, I understand they're 18, 19 years old, people are going to mess up, it happens way too much, it, and it can't be an NCA thing, it has to be between each school. Right. Les Miles has to talk to his kids, you know, Nick Saban's got to talk to his kids, they got to go and make their own sh harsh penalties for each school. Right. So th there's really nothing they could do as far as a rule or a law, but... It's just, it's an unfortunate situation. Right. Well, LSU actually did take the steps because synthetic marijuana is not illegal, is, um, but LSU did take the steps to suspend them. But we all know that this game against the Auburn Tigers, a weak opponent, would they have suspended these three players against Alabama the next week? They'll be back you for know? Alabama. Yeah. They know that that yeah. team is way too strong to be missing three of their best players. Right. Yeah, this is more on the schools. This is a school-administered drug test. This wasn't, and the NCAA has no... Um, control over this. So this is um, um, this is done by the Auburn Tigers. You know these guys are suspended indefinitely. So there is no sentence that's been laid out. You know this reminds me of the Legarrette Blunt suspension. You know when he punched a player in Boise State. You know he was suspended this season by the school. This is more of the school taking action because they don't want. Um, to get a bad name from this. And they shouldn't, right. because if you're going to give this guy a scholarship, you don't want people punching people. Like, no. Golson was helped up by another player, and he got up and just punched him. That You can't act like that. This is more on the schools than it is the NCAA. And um, I know, as far as the NCAA, when you uh, try to strike another player, and as, as one of the rules is that you'll be suspended for a full game. Yeah. Whether if, if, if you're in the halftime, from that half of the game, you're suspended until the next half. But um, William Golston was suspended by the Big Ten, not even mm -hmm. Michigan State. Yeah. They didn't take any type of repercussions. So is, is these schools need to, I guess, I would say take more responsibility and making sure that these kids are acting uh, mature. Um, they, like you said, it's like being paid because you, you're not paying for school. And that's just a tremendous advantage that kids like us that go to school and we, we have an education, we pay for it, that we don't take for granted. Being a college athlete yourself, Ashley, what do you what do you take on on 
the misconduct that's been going on? Um, I just really feel like these kids are being ungrateful with what they have received. And, you know, I really feel like they should take more, take it less for granted because, you know, they're in a position where the other students look up to them, you know, people on TV, they're looking up to them and they're not doing the right thing. And I feel like the school also, like what you guys said, the school should give a harsher punishment to the students so, you know, for the future they learn and other students don't follow in their footsteps. All right. I would also like to say, the only thing, they need to understand that their actions and their behavior doesn't reflect on just them. Yeah, right. It reflects on the football program, right. the whole university, the alumni, the boosters, everybody who backs them. And some of the, we're from New York, we don't really have yeah, a college that, team like that. Yeah. You have to understand teams like Ohio State and Penn State and these big schools, there are people grow up worshiping these, these teams. teams. And True. they need to understand that their actions are seen by, you know, Little kids children. four years old right. all the way up to the adults and the people who used to go there. Mm -hmm. They need to take you know, responsibility. more exactly more responsibility for their own actions, and think about you know it's not just them that it's going to affect me. It's going to affect thousands of other people, if not millions. All right, right. all right, that's enough for this conversation. Uh, we're going to go to halftime right now. Uh, please stay tuned. When we come back, we'll start talking about the NFL. See you soon. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm happy to see you tune back in. <laughs> right, now we're going to go to our third quarter debate. It's going to be our fact and fiction or fiction segment. And the first question is going to be about the Raiders transaction with Kelsey Palmer. Um, Joe, what do you think? Uh, fact, or fi fact or fiction, did the uh, Raiders give up too much to acquire Kelsey Palmer? My belief is that this is fiction. The Raiders already have not been relevant for, you know, eight, ten years since their Super Bowl with Rich Gannon. It's an entire new team. Hugh Jackson needs to make a statement that he's here to win. Jason Campbell goes down. Kyle Bowler is not going to lead them to the playoffs. And we all know that Terrell Pryor is not going to lead them to the playoffs. This is a move that is necessary. If it turns out to be a success, yes, they gave up a first round, maybe two first round picks. But a first round draft pick is never guaranteed. Look at Vernon Goldson, Jamarcus Russell, people like that. That is a first overall draft pick. You know, someone wasted their first round investment on someone that didn't come through. We have a proven quarterback here in 05 and 06. Carson Palmer was mentioned with, you know, he yeah, was mentioned with Tom Brady yes. and Drew Brees and Peyton Manning. This is a good move for them. If this puts them over the top, it could transform them from just a maybe contender to a serious threat in the AFC. Right, and you know, it's so funny. People are always talking about how bad Carson Palmer has been over the years. People have to remember, he had gotten injured, and then he lost the lack of enthusiasm to play for the Bengals because of all the controversies mm -hmm. exactly. and Chad Johnson and their relationship, mm -hmm. and then that played a big role. So... Carlson is excited. He's taking a $5 million pay cut to come over to Oakland. I think he's going to be a re-energized yeah. player to come out here and start throwing the ball around and, and have a successful rest of the season with the Raiders. What do you think, Victor? I'm definitely going to go uh, fiction on this one. They didn't give up too much. It, like you said, it's time for them to go in a new direction. They needed a quarterback. They're 4-2 and two right now. You know, like you said, Cowboys hasn't played a game since 2007. You can't take a chance on a guy like that. Palmer's proven, you know, the Bengals did go to the playoffs one year. They actually lost to a, um, a Steelers team that ended up winning the Super Bowl. Yes. And Palmer, like you said, Palmer got injured and he hasn't really been the same. So, you know, when he has the tools around, like when he had Ushmanzadi, he had Ocho Single, he, now he has these tools. He's got like, he, these guys like McFadden, Darius Hayward Bay. He's got these um, very athletic guys, versatile. I think, I think it's worth it. Definitely worth it. Yeah, Ashley. Back to fiction. Um, I'd have to go fiction on this one. I definitely agree with you guys. And I really think that, you know, now they have what it takes. They have a veteran. They have somebody who knows what they're doing. He's going to go in there, and I think he's going to get the job done. And I feel like, you know, a first draft, um, a first pick, they, you know, it's never guaranteed. Like, nothing's right. guaranteed with that. You don't know what, what was going to happen. I feel like they have somebody who's a guarantee for the most part. And also, like, the Raiders right now are a run first team. So for right now, uh, Carson Palmer can just kind of uh, sit back, let the offense run, throw a couple of play-action pass down the field to these speedy wide receivers that he have in Ford and Hayward Bay. And um, it's just, it's just an exciting, I know, a new atmosphere in Oakland. Like you said, it's been a while since they've been able to be excited about football. Um, they actually won the division, well, they win the division uh, as far as the, the record last year in 6-0. Um, now with all of this, with the Raiders and their new accusation of Carson Palmer, 
do you think that the Raiders could go actually go on and win the, the division this year, Victor, in fact, yeah. I'm going to say fact. You know, they get Casey, and then they get a bye week, and they get Denver. So it gives Carson Palmer a little time to gel with this offense. It takes a lot of time to get things going with the team, especially as a new quarterback when you have to be the leader of that offense, and you're not familiar with playing with these players. You know, the, he does have a, um, a former coach of USC over there. That's going to help him get things going. Um, in fact, they play a couple weak opponents. I, I really think that, you know, they can pull this out, and I think San Diego's too inconsistent in terms of offense. I know they have a good record right now, but San Diego isn't, doesn't always finish as strong. Uh, and Ashley, fact or fiction on this topic? Um, I'd say fact. I think that definitely they have a better chance than they would have before. So, you know, I feel like they're going to, you know, be a good team. I feel like it was definitely a bold move. But, you know, I feel like they're going to they're gonna do good, and they're going to – they're going to take it far in the playoffs. Uh, well, see, I actually am I'm going fiction on this because I actually believe that Chargers is real this year. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually six in the league in passing. So their offense is, you know, you know, Rivers is back there. He's throwing the ball. They're, they're controlling things. And, um, you know, like I said, this is a new team, Oakland. Although I am very excited for their offense, I'm very excited for what they can do um, as far as their um, camaraderie. That's going to take a couple of weeks. And... Um, Chargers already have it. They're four and one. They're coming off a of bye week. They're gonna play um, the Jets this week, and uh, I think that the Chargers actually is gonna uh, win out the division. I'm not saying that the Raiders is not gonna make the playoffs. I be I do. They believe that they're gonna come in as a wild card, but I honestly think that Chargers is gonna take the take the division. What do you think, Joe? See, I'm going the opposite of you. I think that the Raiders end up winning the division, and the Chargers gonna grab the wild card. The Chargers each year. They're always so inconsistent, and Rivers is maybe the only piece of that puzzle that is a consistently great player. Their defense is, you know, they'll shut out a team one week, and the next week they give up 30 points. You never know what you're going to get. With the Raiders, their rushing attack is unbelievable. Finally, Hayward Bay, for the first two years, three years, not that great. He's finally coming into his own. Demarius Moore has been a great acquisition for them. Jacoby Ford is their, you know, their slash speedster. And I just feel Hugh Jackson already has worked with Carson Palmer. He was on the Bengals coaching staff in 2005, 2006. They already have a rapport. I think that with Palmer in the mix, that they're going to take the division. And the Chargers have nothing, you know, no injuries. They're going to win the wild card. All right. And staying in the AFC West, we're going to talk about Tebow. We all know that Tebow, after coming off a bye, that he was named the starter of this uh, next game against the Dolphins. Vic, what do you think? Fact or fiction? Is it Tebow's time to shine? Oh, it's definitely Tebow time. I'm completely fact. This guy's paid his dues. This guy completely changed his, his, his form and his throwing just to be able to prove that he can still play quarterback because this kid really wants to play quarterback. Everybody said he was going to be able to do it. It seems every time he comes into this lineup that he just completely takes over. You know, he knows how to run an offense. You know, he, he was under a great system uh, in Florida. And I really think that after sitting on the bench a few years and coming in, um, as a backup quarterback, I think he's going to be ready for a starting role. I think, you know, this, this kid's ready. All right, actually, fact and fiction, Tebow, time to shine. Um, I'd say it's fact. I think that Tebow, he's ready. I feel like he's going to go in there. He's going to do what he has to do. The fans love him. You know, he has, he has, you know, what it takes. And I feel like, why not? Just give him a chance. The Broncos are one in five, so why not? Oh, I'm, I'm going to actually go fiction on this. I'm sorry, Tim Tebow. You're a great guy. I feel like you have a lot of, of spirit, camaraderie with your teammates. Your teammates go into the huddle. They're looking forward to playing with you. But the fact is this, you do not have the footwork. You do not have the quarterback um, awareness. You, you're just an energizer bunny right now. After weeks and weeks of playing, is this energy of Tebow time, Tebow running this Denver Broncos organization into the playoffs is going to die. Uh, after they, he faces NFL uh, defenses with great schemes of, of uh, just limiting him to very little um, running, because you know that's his strength is running. He, does, he can't throw the ball down the field. I'm, I'm sorry. He's a great guy, but he just doesn't has it, have it as far as an uh, NFL quarterback. Joe? The only thing I want to be careful of is to don't say the word never involving Tim Tebow. Out of high school, he was told he's not going to be able to play quarterback. He goes to Florida. You know, he shares time with Chris Leak his first year. He goes on to have one of the best college careers ever. They talk about him that he used to go to the meetings at 6.30 in the morning with the coaches of Florida to help make their game plans. Nobody is going to be more prepared to step into a starting role than Tim Tebow. They invested their 25th overall first-round draft pick on Tim Tebow. La given three, years last, or three games last year to start, isn't a big enough sample uh. to see if he's going to be the starter. 
you got to give him a chance. You got to hand over the reins, like she said. They're one in five. There isn't much to play for this year. Let's see if we, you know, made a good pick with our first round draft pick, or you know, we have to move on from there. And then you know whether or not next year you have to start looking for another quarterback. I just, I personally don't think that Tim Tebow is the quarterback for the future for the Broncos. And um, it's, just, it's just, I don't think like you, you see his footwork. I mean, if if he changes technique. I would definitely be a part of the Tim Tebow bandwagon, but just right now, it's just well, I it's guess too we'll see, right? I guess we will see. <laughs> All right, um, now we will go to commercial break. When we come back for fourth quarter, stay tuned. We're going to talk more about NFL football. This is what's happening. Our show is so wildly popular that we need to make more. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, Something yeah. Something that will more viewers. Guys, oh my God. I was brushing my teeth yesterday, and I realized exactly what the TV is. What? Oh my god, that's incredible. <laughs> Does that look familiar, guys? I mean, I'm just saying, we're going back to a fourth quarter debate, and it's about the coaching wars that's been going on in the NFL. Uh, Jim Harbaugh, we all know about Jim Harbaugh, Jim Schwartz, their little incident. What do you make of this, Jim? Uh, uh, sorry, Joe. What do you make of this? I, I think it's been blown out of proportion way too much the entire week. That's all they talked about on Monday, Tuesday, was the handshake, the gate, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> It's been so blown out of proportion. If Honestly, if I'm a fan of the 49ers or the Lions, I'm happy about this. I have a new coach who's enthusi enthusiastic. He is here to you know, get us into, in shape to, to win some games. They are two lonely franchises. They have been brutal the last couple of years. I finally have a coach who's here to win. They both got winning records. It's not like this happened with two 0-5 teams. Right. You know, it's been blown out of proportion enough. Whose fault is it? You know, it's Harbaugh's fault for slapping him. Yeah. He admitted that. But it's also Schwartz's fault for chasing him down. And, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't do any better by chasing him down right. the field and starting more problems. Yeah, Vic. That's exactly what I'm going to say. What is Jim Schwartz doing running after him after that? Look, Harbaugh in the, in the, in the press conference right immediately said, says, I shook his hand too hard. You know, and he said, I'm not going to apologize for that. And he shouldn't. He's fired up about a win. This team's, like, like Joe said, they've got a winning record. These teams have something to be proud about for once. And they just knocked off the Lions, who, you know, like we said last week, were the, were the hottest team in the NFL. So it's absolutely, he pulled up his sweater, you even saw a bit of his stomach, it was hilarious. I love it. you got to have a coach that is fired up. That's why the 49ers got him, because he was going to come in from Stanford, from a college program, and bring that atmosphere to the 49ers. <laughs> Ashley? Uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you guys. I can understand why they're, they're making such a big deal about it, because, you know, there's certain things that you do and you don't do in sports. There's certain protocol that you take after the game, and, you know, it's sportsmanship. Like, you shouldn't go that hard. Why is that necessary? It's not necessary to do that. And I feel like both of them really handled themselves with no class, and they should have more class not only for themselves, but for the game. Proper, proper. You see that handshake? That is what we expect right. from our NFL uh, coaches at the end of the game. Um, it's sad that this type of professionalism, we try to t preach to our kids when they, when they grow up, sportsmanship, sportsmanship, and when we see that, although it, ha you know, it energizes the team, um, unfortunately, we're trying to, it's, it's more than that. We know we're, they're, better, they're role models to our youth. Um, but as far as all the coaching um, controversies going on, you heard Rex Ryan comments about uh, if he was coaching the Chargers for those years when they had LaDania Thomason, the explosive offense, he would have cut one a couple of uh, Super Bowls. And then you heard um, the reaction from North Turner. Turner. Um, Took a shot back at him, though. Yeah, respect yeah. for that. Um, but now that we getting into the coaches' conversation, um, talk, what type of coach would you rather play for? Would you play for the Jim uh, Harbaugh, the uh, Rex Ryan, boastful, or would you play for the Bill Belichick that's kind of just sitting there and um, orchestrating the, um, the team? Vic, what do you think? Definitely a Rex Ryan guy. 
uh, one, because I'm a Jets fan, two, because I love any coach that's going to get in your face and get you fired up. I understand Belichick wins, and that's pretty much what everybody considers the most important thing. At the end of the day, you've got to play for a coach who's going to get you fired up, who's going to like that you're talking on the field. The trash talk's great. It gets everybody fired up. It puts everybody on the edge. So for me, it's, you've got to get a, you gotta get a coach who's going to be there, who's going to be excited, who really cares about the team. Yeah, yeah. Ashley, what do you, what do you think? Um, I'm going to have to go with Rex Ryan also because, you know, he's just more energetic, more passionate. And, you know, football is all about passion, all about the passion you have about the sport. I would definitely have to go with Rex Ryan on that one. Um, Belichick, yes, he wins, but, you know, he's more laid back and he seems, you know, more distant. And, you know, I don't know if I can get along with that kind of coach. Yeah, Joe. The way I look at it is you're in the NFL for one thing, to win. Everybody talks about the Super Bowl championships. That's all that matters. And... If I wanted a coach who was going to be my friend and we were going to go hang out, yeah, I would love to play for Jim Harbaugh or Rex Ryan, but you got to look at the championships. Right. And over the last 10, 15 years, what type of coaches win the Super Bowl every year? There's only been one or two, you could say, between like Gruden and maybe Bill Cowher, that you're, you know, your rah-rah guys. If you're going to think of the coaches who consistently win, look at the last couple of years. you got Tony Dungy, you know, Sean Payton, Mike McCarthy. These guys barely say anything. Bill Belichick. At their press conferences, they might be boring, but we don't know what it's like behind the doors to right. play for them exactly. in the locker room. I'm going with the Super Bowl championships here. They're more important right. than Rex Ryan going out and trying to be a celebrity instead of just a football coach. Right, and that's another thing. It's just that we just don't know what goes on on a football field other than what we see in a press conference. We think that Rex Ryan's more effective because he's rah rah and on and press and everything. But I honestly think that Bill Belichick's coaching style is actually better. Um, I would. I played for a high school coach that played that was similar to Bill Belichick's, and it was just much more effective when when you kept your composure. A coach that kept their composure throughout the game and um, never showed any highs and lows, and it just kept me confident that no matter what happened on the field, we always had a chance because of that type of even kill. Um, but yeah, that's enough for it. We, um, we're gonna go to our final thoughts. Vic, what are your final thoughts of today? Um, well. Um, college basketball preseason polls came out. It's never truly really talking about college basketball. It seems we're talking about bracketology, you know, with Joe Lenardi bet in like in June when the, when the season hasn't even started. Uh, it's great to see there's some form of basketball going to be going on. I'm, I'm excited. All right, Ashley. Um, you know, something that I just wanted to mention this week that Dan Weldon, he died this week in an um, IndyCar race. You know, he was 33 years old. It was a 15 car crash. He died. And, you know, with this, I really feel like. Um, IndyCar and NASCAR, they should really take more steps mm. for safety and All things right. like that. So, you know, our prayers go out to him. All right. And, uh, Joe, what do you think? Um, the last um, thing I just want to bring up is the Jerome Harrison thing. Um, for, you, for those who don't know, he was getting traded from the Lions to the Eagles, and whenever a trade goes on in the NFL, that player is subject to a physical. And during the physical, doctors found out he has a brain tumor. And if it wasn't for the trade, then he might not have had another physical until this upcoming summer. And now doctors have come out and say that because they caught it so early, that there's a, definitely a higher chance that he's going to make a full recovery and maybe even end up back in the NFL. So our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, Jerome Harrison and his family. And this past week, we had uh, Magic Johnson, yes, the legend Magic Johnson, come visit us at U Albany. Um, it was a very exciting uh, experience to meet him. I met him myself. We got the chance to interview him. I was the cameraman. And um, he's just a nice guy, um, well, well, like harm, heartwarming type fella. He's a great person. Um, he made a couple of comments about LeBron. Everybody believes that he's right. Uh, but uh, it was just a, it was a fun experience to get to meet such a great, cla high class uh, individual. All right, thank you for watching with us from UA Overtime. I've been Jermaine Dennis. This is Victor Weberman, Ashley Whitfield, Joe Marshall. Thank you and good night.